So, one of the most difficult passages, in my opinion, in the book of Judges is comes in chapter 11, 12, uh, right around in there, where we have the story of Jephthah, right? Jephthah is a judge, um, uh, essentially a chieftain or warlord that the Lord raises up to deliver Israel from its enemies surrounding it. So there's this um, military crisis, and God raises up this leader, and this leader then promises to God that if God would only deliver the um, his enemies into his hands, then he would sacrifice to God the first thing that comes out of his house. Now, you guys know, I'm sure if you've read this story, that the first thing that comes out of his house is his daughter. And Jephthah makes good on his vow and sacrifices his daughter, right? She asks for some time to go out and mourn the fact that she'll die without a husband. Uh, Jephthah allows her to do that and then comes back and he kills her. So one of the, th the things that I think we need to understand about this story in the book of Judges as a whole, we have to interpret this story in the context of the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is a downward spiral of God's people. And it's showing how they are becoming more like the Canaanites. Okay, One author called this the Canaanization of Israel. The book of Judges shows that. God established the people of Israel after Exodus, or in Exodus, I'm sorry, and he said, I want you to be a light to the nations. And so he gives them this law, and he says, here, you're a country now, or you're a nation now, and I want you to be a light to all the nations around you. Fast forward, the Deuteronomy ends right on the edge of the promised land. Joshua records how they go into the promised land, and then judges, boom, they're in the promised land, and things are getting bad fast. Rather than being a light to the nations, the people of Israel are becoming like the nations. The nations are being a, a darkness to them and encroaching upon them. And this this section in Judges, in my opinion, shows the danger of a wrong theology, right? So in the ancient Near East, the gods were transactional. You worshipped a god or um, made sacrifices to a god in order to get something from that god. So you needed rain to fall, you needed crops to grow, you needed the land to be fertile. And in order to, do, to get that, that's something the gods gave. In order to get that, you had to give something to the god, which was sacrifices, devotion, that sort of thing. So there's this transactional relationship, right? I give you this, you give me that. And we see in Judges, with the story of Jephthah, that he's adopted this worldview. He's adopted this false theology of God. And he sees him, sees God, as transactional. He says, okay, I will give God this thing, whatever comes out of my house first, and in turn, God will give me this other thing. So he's adopted the cultural idea, the culture around him. He's adopted their view of God and applied that to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And what's more, his daughter also has adopted this view of God. So you see her saying she doesn't protest. She doesn't say, wait, that's not how God is. That's not how the Lord is. Jephthah has adopted this worldview. His daughter has adopted this worldview. And neither one of them stopped to consider the fact that God doesn't want human sacrifice. God, and further, God is not a transactional God. So even if God did desire human sacrifice, which he doesn't, He's still not transactional in the sense that you say, I'll give you this and you give me that. And so this wrong theology about who God is, viewing God transactionally, which Jephthah had gotten from the culture around him, had dire consequences for both him and his daughter. He lost a daughter and his daughter, our daughter, lost her life, right? His daughter lost her life. And so understanding who God is and understanding that God loves us and we live in relationship with God and that God gives us things because he's God, or he doesn't give us things because he's God, has significant in, in influence on our own lives, right? If we have a faulty understanding of God, if we think God is transactional, that can have real-world implications for how we see. And I know you guys have done this before, right? Or, I mean, I don't know that. I've done this before. Um, God, if you only do this, then give me that. I just watched the movie um, Bad Boys for Life, no judging. Um, I also, I realized the reason old actors continue watching or making movies is because old people will continue watching those movies, you know? So I grew up with Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, and so um, 
and, and so my wife and I went to see uh, Bad Boys for Life. And in this film, uh, Martin Lawrence's character, I can't remember his name in the movie, um, makes this deal with God. He says, God, if you'll only deliver or you know heal Will Smith's character, then I will not do any more violence. Okay? And that, I, that kind of picture of God is common. If you do this, I will do that. So it assumes a transactional view of God, and it also assumes, like Britt pointed out to me, that God even has something that we want. Now, it's silly in the movie, but in the book of Judges, it had significant and long-lasting impact. So what I, I guess what I want to push in on and focus in on is how we view God and how we view our relationship with God can and does have real-world implications. If we view God transactionally, like he is just some being up there that we do things for and then get things from, that is not true. He is a God who loves us and made it possible for us to have a relationship with him through the death and resurrection of his son. And we don't have anything to offer God, and everything we have is a gift from God. So, so our culture in the South, this view of God as transactional is pretty common. And one of the ways that Christians can push back against that is to say, no, it's God's not transactional, God's relational. And he made it possible for us to have a relationship with him. And we enter into that relationship uh, in, um, through faith in Christ and his death and resurrection. And we live in light of that. And we live in obedience because of that. But our obedience doesn't get stuff for us, right? And we can't bargain with God in the sense of, if you do this, then I'll do that. I don't know if you guys can hear my kids screaming, but um, I don't know why they're screaming. So anyway, I'll wrap this up. Just wanted to, yeah, have a good one. Thanks so much for listening.